hello and welcome back and today I want to talk about backups that's right another before you buy with a slight difference today I want to talk about backups and also to help people differentiate the difference between good data storage practice and backups these are incredibly important things but they're also different the key word you're going to hear a lot throughout this is redundancy which a lot of people mistake for backups and again whether it was the Q locker stuff that's happened recently or time and time again when people have lost data all too often one of the reasons data is lost permanently is because of people's misunderstanding about the difference between backups and redundancy and in today's video we're really going to drill down into this in a kind of chewable crayon easy friendly fashion on top of that we are going to talk about some services that are very brand specific we're also going to talk about ones that are more generalized to the whole field of network attached storage but first and foremost let's actually whack it down on the table what is a backup what really is a backup nice and simple it is a collection of data that doesn't exist in one place nice and simple if for example you've got a bunch of phones and tablets and all kinds of stuff around your house and you buy yourself a NAS and again this is an example I tell a lot you sit there you take loads of photos you browse stuff you watch stuff on the stuff and then you go do you know what back it all up to the NAS back it all up to the NAS even if you back it up to the cloud one way or another but you back it all up somewhere all of these devices and then on this phone you go what oh, I'm running out of space oh actually I've backed those up to the NAS I can delete all of those congratulations you don't have a backup anymore because all of those files now exist in one place they're not in two places anymore that is the difference and too many people um, have maybe a NAS system that they back up loads of you know office devices to what they have there is an archive not a backup it's an incredibly important difference and in today's video when we talk about backups it's important that you understand that what I'm talking about is NAS backups NAS to something backups not client to device it's very important because most of the things we're going to talk about today are things that you can do with a NAS and most of these practices do not apply outside of NAS so do bear that in mind for it but yes that's a backup it is a collection of data that exists somewhere else as well big old noisy plane above me now why is that distinction uh, very very important because a number of people have been utilizing NAS devices and going oh I have got a backup I've got a RAID it's got RAID inside RAID is a method of redundancy it is literally built into the title redundant array of inexpensive disks or more modernly redundant array of independent disks I'm covering all of you so you don't flame me in the comments like when I said router instead of router now with uh, RAID the idea is with RAID is that you have multiple disks like this and with each of the disks you install inside, let's take a RAID 5, you have data being written across these disks one by one. In every wave, it goes, whoosh, data is being spread across them. And each time, a little bit of data known as parity, which is like a blueprint, is put on one of the disks. And with each wave, the parity is written to a different disk. Now, if in the event that one of your drives dies, develops a fault, or just knackers, or someone accidentally pulls it out, the good thing is that RAID, being a safety net, is able to visibly see all of your data thanks to the data that remains on these disks and the little blueprint that's been moved around. And then when you introduce a new disk, wallop, the system can rebuild the data using the blueprints and your data has that safety net. It can take a punch. But that's not RAID for several reasons. First and foremost, because all the data it's not in another location it's still just in one place the second thing and this is something a lot of people overlook in a raid when a drive fails it's generally because either the drive has been overused or exceeded its um, uh, reported maximum utilization or it developed a fault that could have happened at factory level these drives are you know manufactured in their hundreds of thousands but the thing is when you buy NAS hard drives or any hard drive for that matter when you buy them you buy them from the same shop and they don't go to the shelf and take a drive from different boxes they take the drive from the same box a carton of 20 drives that they purchased from WDSC gate or whoever so if there's a fault in one drive there is a possibility that that fault at the manufacturing level happened to every drive and if one of your drives fails now 
there's a possibility that that fault is going to happen again. And if you've only got one disk of failure, you don't know how long it could potentially be before another disk dies. And it's not just about a potential fault with the manufacturing sector. It can be that the fault happened that someone ripped the power cable by accident by tripping on it on the system. It can be that the controller board at the back died in the middle of a heavy write process and the disks, while being engaged with, they powered down and consequently caused a critical failure. Bad sectors, stuff like that. So RAID should never, ever, ever be considered a backup because although it's incredibly useful as a safety net, and again, you should have maybe a two disc failure for that matter, as a backup, it is not. Sorry, that sounded a bit Yoda, didn't it? So do bear that in mind. RAID is useful, always keep RAID, but at the same time, it is not a suitable alternative to a backup. And I know I've laboured that point, so I'll drop it here. So that moves us on to the difference between uh, backups and safe working practices. Because along with RAID, there is another good safe working process with data that people mistake for a backup, and that is snapshots. Now, snapshots, for those that aren't aware, as the name kind of suggests, are snapshots, kind of blueprints of the existing data on your system, kind of slightly minimized version. Say you've got a terabyte of data and then the system takes a snapshot of the data. It's basically a layout of the data. And then on a period of your choosing, it takes another snapshot later. And then maybe once every hour, maybe once every day, every 12 hours, depending on the space, these snapshots get stored to the system. Each time it happens, snapshot, it's stored down. Now, these snapshots are um, hierarchical and they use a hereditary system where they have to be time linked. So the first one might be uh, the first of the month, the second of the month, third of the month, fourth of the month, fifth of the month, etc., etc. But you need every version between now and the one you want to restore. If any of these get deleted or the original files are deleted at any point, then you can't return back. It's very important that, for example, if the snapshot happens later on and the files were deleted or removed between, it doesn't stop the snapshot recovering, but it will create a larger snapshot image or a smaller snapshot image. And then, based on the time management you have, because you might go, I want a retention of 100 images, at image 101, it overwrites the first one. So then that's gone. So again, not a backup. It's more, again, a fail safe, particularly in this time of ransomware. But a lot of you use snapshots, but at the same time, keep them on the NAS. Now you can use snapshot archiving software, and there are lots of little ways in which you can um, have snapshots stored off system. But once again, those snapshots are useless off system if the original data is gone or the drives are gone. So again, they are a safety net somewhere in the region of RAID, but by no means a backup. They are safe working practice for your data, but not a backup. So between these two methods of backing up and safe working data practice, which ones are a backup and which ones aren't a backup? And more importantly, is it worth having all of them? Well, a lot of the time you can't have all of them. You just can't, either due to the physical limitations of the NAS, the physical limitations of your workspace, or simply that to try to run all of them at once would effectively make your system run at a crawl. So although it would be ideal to use all of these, and I know a lot of high-end business users, particularly rack mount users, which we'll touch on in a bit, are able to use all of these, do bear in mind in a lot of cases, you are gonna have to pick and choose between them. So let's go straight into the backups. Backups with a NAS, remember, that's what we're talking about. Everything from client to NAS, you, you do you. But with NAS backups and making sure that the data on the NAS can live somewhere else, they can generally be broken down into three key backups. They are NAS to USB backups, NAS to cloud backups, and NAS to NAS backups. So the first one, as the name suggests, is you take an external drive, big old external USB, a small USB like this, or a giant one like some of those GTEx up there, you connect them to your system, and then periodically, the NAS will back up the entire contents or just the files and folders you care about onto that USB. And then you can leave the USB connected, not recommended, or periodically connect it, back up, walk away. That's why a lot of NASs have USB front-mounted copy buttons because some people don't trust the software inside to perform that action. And what they want is to connect a drive, 
click that button. Now those USB backups can be incremental, they can be differential, which means it'll only, after the first big backup, only worry about the big changes rather than overwrite everything every time. And some of those backups are full revisions and versioning, which is when you go, right, that's Monday, bang, Tuesday, even if the files are the same, bang, Tuesday. And it can keep whole records if you have a multitude of different disks. What's the downsides of a USB backup? It's not the safest, and obviously it requires a degree of human intervention in order to do so. That human intervention of a USB backup is what kind of lets it down, and that's why ultimately a lot of users end up leaving a USB drive connected to the NAS, which unfortunately, unless they encrypt that USB, means that if someone gets into the NAS and can do malicious stuff, they can also have access to that USB backup. So again, if you're gonna use a USB backup, take advantage of the, or make sure you bear in mind about the human factor in that going back and forth. Now, the next one is NAS to cloud backups. This is probably one of the easiest ones to use, but it's also the most expensive, I believe, in the long term. So, say you have a NAS that's fully populated with, the, let's say, four TB drives. Let's play it safe, four bay like this. So in Array 5, you're looking at 12 TB of storage there. Now, that 12 TB of storage, let's go on the assumption that all of that storage is what you want to keep, not just certain key folders. You're saying the whole thing. Maybe you're half fully populated, you've got some extra space to call it 6 TB of utilization. 6 TB of cloud space isn't gonna be the cheapest. You can get disaster recovery services where it's image-based backup, and Synology's own one as well in C2, um, but at the same time, these still work out a little bit more expensive. I mean, they are advantageous that there's no real human intervention required, and that data is being backed up to the cloud. And some cloud services like C2, when they're backed up to the cloud, are not only fully encrypted, but also they have versioning built in, which is incredibly useful, but it is going to be expensive in the long term. And obviously, the bigger the NAS, the larger capacity, the more it's going to cost you in cloud storage. And again, that's when you have to look at image backup rather than individual file back. And by image, I mean whole system. So the third means is, I think, the best one of all. And I know a number of you will disagree because of the cloud. And remember, you can use all of these, and I recommend you do, but that's NAS to NAS backups. Whether it's the same brand or using a third party, maybe you upgraded from an old NAS, I think that for me is the best one out there. You have your network, you have a NAS either in your home or office and another NAS on the same network or in a completely different re uh, remote location and periodically the NAS will back up onto that second device and that can be a live two-way sync. It can be um, only differences are saved. So this one ends up being, even if you delete files, which you shouldn't, because then it's not a backup, we said at the beginning, you can have it so that the NAS maintains a full record of all the bigger files, while this one periodically empties and refills, and this one goes up. But again, that's not a backup anymore. These sort of backups, NAS to NAS backups, are expensive on day one. They're probably the most expensive of these three options on day one. But at the same time, as time wears on, they are by far the most affordable USB drives. They may be very affordable at the beginning, but they have their limitations in terms of space and the intelligence of the backup as well and that human intervention. And NAS to Cloud has the versioning, removes the human intervention, but at the same time, it's going to work out way more expensive over time when you look at that kind of level of storage. So another NAS, you can go ahead and get a super budget option so if you go for a 920, you can get like a 420J or even a 220J with bigger drives, and that will work out a lot more affordable overall. So those are kind of the big data backups. And they're not all of them. There's a few little middling ones in between using third-party services, but NAS to NAS, NAS to cloud, NAS to USB, for me, should be, you should have at least two of those in a rigorous data storage and data backup strategy. But what about the safe working practices that I talked about? Let's talk about the main data um, store, um, the kind of data uh, safe work in practice overall. We've already talked about RAID, and again, always having one disk of redundancy, but I would always recommend two if you're going above eight disks, if I'm honest, um, particularly for business users. After RAID, we've got the snapshots that we've talked about. Having snapshots, always useful, but again, not a backup. Think of it as a safe, safe work in practice to have those versioning of certain shared folders or whole volumes. On top of that, drive checks periodically. Now, a number of people either don't know about this or don't look into this until they start showing bad sectors. Um, all the NAS brands, all of them, every single one of them, 
give you the ability to schedule smart checks on the disks, where periodically the, de the disks are checked for any inconsistencies, uh, recommended issues, and they have a database of errors, which it refers to to go, what, this drive is showing signs of this um, error 1573892. Now, smart checks and scheduled smart checks, or even uh, uh, RAID checks and RAID scrubbing and stuff like that can all be scheduled. But some go a little further. So if we look at, um, say, get Iowolf, for example, um, they have two things on all of their drives. I think a number of you might be well to be aware of. You don't have to go for it, but I do think it's worthy of comment. One, they have their own drive check system, um, the Iowolf Health Management, that runs alongside smart checks. And it has even more um, uh, collected aggregate data on drive errors that it can compare against. So again, having both of those inside, very, very useful indeed. But the other thing Seagull Iron Wolf have is rescue data recovery services. Now, only in the re last six or seven months, now all of recovery drives include um, data recovery services in uh, inside. You get three years, and that's not just the pro, that's the standard disk as well, you get data recovery. Now that data recovery extends to accidental deletion, malware infection, physical damage, if it can be proven that it was beyond your fault. Again, I always refer to it, but a couple of years ago, we really knocked some drives around. We dropped them in water, we kicked them down the stairs, we smashed them against the table, and then we sent the drive to Seagate for recovery. And you know, 98, 99% of the data was recovered. They don't, they'll try their hardest to give you 100% back, but if they can't, or if it's an array configuration, you have to send all the drives back. There's no 100% guarantee, but as a safe work in practice, it's better to have it than to not have it at all. And given that data recovery services cost thousands, tens of thousands and more, depending on the size of the data and the fact they have to go through it bit by bit by bit to rebuild the data, having that included for free on a drive for three years, given that these are already cheaper drives than WD right now, even during shortages, it's definitely worth something looking at there. And I know that seems like a massive plug for Seagate there, and I apologize that it's gone that way, but fair play to them. They're the only ones that include that, and I do think it's worth a mention. Um, after this, we can look into more enterprise level stuff. Now I say enterprise, one of these isn't really enterprise. It used to be very enterprise, but not anymore. And that is, UPS is. Now, having a UPS used to be something that no one had in their right mind. You know, it was just so enterprise. It was the idea of servers themselves being in our homes. But now you can get UPSs, uninterruptible power suppliers, that are, you know, a couple of hundred quid, not even that. And these, uh, you connect your server or other important devices to it. Now, most people think a UPS, they go, what's the point of a UPS? if my um, power goes out, it's only gonna last for a little while. It won't run the NAS for very long, it's a waste of money. It's not about running the NAS for as long as possible so you can interact with your data. I mean, you can, but that shouldn't be why you buy UPS. The reason you should buy a UPS is because if the power in your home or business dies, the NAS can get a message, a poke from the UPS because it's connected and it will say, uh, the power's gone out, you're running on the UPS, and you can set it to either automatically or upon a manual prompt, shut the NAS down safely. And that's the point of the UPS, not to keep running the system, or maybe if you run an area with intermittent power, or you like living on a houseboat or something, maybe you'll use it in that way. But predominantly, UPSs are designed that if the event the power goes out, that your hardware safely shuts down automatically or manually by yourself upon a notification. So again, Having a UPS, given how incredibly affordable they are now, they're worth a punt if you are worried about your data. And it's a couple of hundred quid, and I would say UPSs are up there with RAID, in my opinion. Now, the last two, again, far more enterprise. One is to do with rack mount and redundant power suppliers. A redundant power supplier is when a system has two PSUs. It has either two PSUs or two power inputs into the system so that in the event that a power supplier breaks, and by power supplier, I'm talking about stuff like this. This is uh, for that NAS, this little PSU here, the green light. If this dies, which is always on, if this dies and the NAS is on, it can damage the data, it can damage the drives, it can damage an ongoing read-write operation. A redundant power supply has two of these, either inside or externally in some rare cases. And in that scenario, if a PSU dies, 
because they're running parallel, the system doesn't shut down because the other PSU is just there and it's continuing to work. You'll get a notification that says the PSU is just, uh, just knackered, buy another one, or if you've got one in a cupboard, plug it in, it will be covered by your warranty. But that is a great way in line, I would say, with UPS, but not quite the same thing, to make sure your data can take a hit. Remember, that's what this is about. And finally, another big one here, and this is something I think a lot of home users just do, that it's not in their field. In the same way I've said UPSs and servers in the home are now kind of an understandable thing, this isn't anywhere near that yet, and it's very enterprise, and that is called high availability, having a redundant system. Now, redundant systems are either like a big rack mount that's got two CPUs, two controller boards, two sets of memory, two sets of ports, two sets of PSUs, and if one system controller board breaks, the other one runs fine, and they're all connected to the same system, ow. Or you can have two NASes side by side, and Synology kind of do really well on this, running a Synology high availability environment. That's two NASes with the same drive, same CPU, same build, and you are interacting with your single NAS as far as the world can see, but the single NAS has got two NASes behind it. That well, You are seeing one, but it's really two NASes that are running all the same processes, and if one NAS dies, a PSU breaks, the other one carries on. It's the same principle as the redundant PSU, but on a whole system-wide level. Now, they can go into uh, two versions, active-active, active-passive, active, and that is active-passive is when you have two of them. One is the primary, one is the secondary, and then if the primary dies, the secondary is moved over, which can take um, minutes uh, normally, and then in that scenario, that second system will then step in and resume all activities, and there's a tiny little drop between operations in the case of the passive server dying nothing stops nothing's interrupted but the system administrator will be told that the passive server died in the case of an active active um, high availability environment you have two systems again running but this time not only can you use all of the resources if you choose so you can choose to use two cpus to get the job done two sets of memory etc but in the event that one of those systems dies the transition is so much faster. It can take seconds, less than a minute in some cases. And we did loads of tests um, in, in previous years with the rack man at the desktop, uh, active, 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 passive scenarios. But when that transition happens, if you are running processes that are using both CPUs, obviously you get a sudden bottleneck there. If you're doing it intermittently or just for individual jobs, doesn't matter so much. But if you're constantly using both CPUs and then one of them dies, that's too much for one CPU to do, and then it's time to tick in before your system falls over. But this has been backups for your NAS, backups and safe data working practices. I know this has been a long run running video. It's gone on for a while. I apologize for the length of it, but this is a subject that's very, very important and one that we seem to touch on at least once a month, and lots of people lose their data and it's just not on. Click like if you've enjoyed the video, click subscribe to learn more, and of course, take advantage of the free advice section below at NAS Compares. It's a completely free service, it's unbiased, we're not going to charge you anything, it's myself and Eddie the web guy. If you have a question about the right data storage setup for you, you're wondering about the right data storage um, backup and integral system of data in your home or business, and you don't want to spend money and then not get safe working, uh, safe data storage strategy in return, Ask our opinion, ask our advice. What have you got to lose? It might take an extra day or so, but there's only the pair of us, but we will answer every email. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.